So how can we use this knowledge of binding affinity in Half-Life when it comes to topical anti-androgens in treating androgenetic alopecia? Well, the potential of topical anti-androgens in treating androgenetic alopecia hinges on some core principles. And I would say these core principles are, one, the topical anti-androgens affinity to the androgen receptor, Two, the concentration of the topical anti-androgen when it comes to saturating the scalp skin and the androgen receptors in the scalp skin. Three, the longevity of the topical anti-androgen's effects, which is determined by its half-life. And four, the inability for the topical anti-androgen to go systemic. And I think this particular aspect is probably the most important one, because if the topical anti-androgen were to go systemic, that would pose some significant problems. So yeah, number four, topical anti-androgen going systemic, that concern has to be fleshed out as not being a factor. So when considering the use of a topical anti-androgen, it's not merely about the affinity, but the overall strategy that leverages the concentration and the pharmacokinetics to effectively counteract DHT's detrimental effects on hair follicles. So what's the takeaway here? The takeaway should be that if we want to be more effective in halting androgenetic alopecia, even in people who have aggressive genetics for it, the aim is to saturate the scalp with a high concentration of a topical anti-androgen agent that does not go systemic, and in doing so, outcompete DHT. If the topical anti-androgen in question has a weak affinity, like with class cauterone only being 2.5%, of testosterone's affinity for the androgen receptor, a higher concentration of the topical anti-androgen or any topical anti-androgen agent may be needed in order to saturate the scalp hair follicles androgen receptor cells and thus outcompete DHT. But remember, and I've also mentioned this before on this channel, although it's effective in many men, and we can even see this in the twin dutasteride case study, 0.5 milligrams up to 2.5 milligrams of oral dutasteride respectively leaves 50 to 20 percent remaining DHT in the scalp. For those who have severe genetics for androgenetic alopecia, it would probably be of interest to engage the remainder DHT by blocking the scalp hair follicle androgen receptors. I would encourage a different mindset to be adopted as I have seen people be disappointed with the reported hair gains from CB03 01 or class cauterone's clinical trials for androgenetic alopecia, I think topical anti-androgens can be firstly seen as a point of stabilization. Because think about it, if you're blocking the androgen receptor on your scalp day by day, DHT cannot bind to the hair follicle and thus the hair follicle itself can be stabilized and potentially revert to its original pre-androgenetic alopecia growing condition. Now, there are many narratives concerning reflex hyperandrogenicity. To keep it short, it's the idea that because the human body attempts to achieve homeostasis, it will attempt to upregulate the production of DHT through backdoor channels, or the upregulation of androgen receptors. Now, I've heard many narratives. For instance, some people state that reflex hyperandrogenicity occurs when there is less serum and scalp DHT due to the use of drugs like finasteride and dutasteride. The accusation here is because finasteride and dutasteride decrease 5-alpha reductase in the serum and the scalp, and thus backdoor pathways are triggered, causing for more DHT to be produced. However, these backdoor pathways rely the presence of 5-alpha reductase, which kind of makes things a bit more confusing concerning this whole concerning this whole hyperandrogenicity effect. Here's my reasoning. For hyperandrogenicity, the 5-alpha reductase enzyme is crucial for backdoor pathways. This is for the case of 5-alpha reductase inhibitors like finasteride and dutasteride being the cause of such reflex hyperandrogenicity. In one particular pathway, the 17-OHP pathway, the first step of this pathway is the 5-alpha reduction of 17-alpha hydroxyprogesterone, or 17-OHP, to 17-OHDHP. Now, this particular reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme SRD5A1, or 5-alpha reductase type 1, which is another form of the 5-alpha reductase enzyme. 
We also have the progesterone pathway, the P4 pathway. And the first step of synthesis of DHT from progesterone is also a 5-alpha reduction. In this instance, P4 is converted to 5-alpha dihydroprogesterone or 5-alpha DHP. And this reaction is again facilitated by the enzyme SRD5A1 or 5-alpha reductase type 1. So as you can see here, in both pathways, 5-alpha reductase plays a pivotal role in initiating the series of reactions leading to the synthesis of DHT via backdoor pathways. The 5-alpha reduction step is crucial because it sets the substrate on the path that bypasses testosterone and androstenedione, which are key intermediaries in the classical androgen synthesis pathway. Without 5-alpha reductase activity or significant 5-alpha reductase activity, the backdoor pathway would not be effectively initiated, and the production of DHT through this alternative route would be compromised. So drugs like finasteride and dutasteride are 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. If they effectively inhibit 5-alpha reductase activity, they would theoretically also impact the conversion process in the backdoor pathways, namely the 17-OHP and P4 pathways. So, if the backdoor pathways heavily rely on this 5-alpha reduction of 17-OHP or P4 as their initial steps, and 5-alpha reductase is being inhibited by finasteride or dutasteride, then this would logically reduce the biosynthesis of DHT through these backdoor pathways. This counters the idea of reflex hyperandrogenicity, where the body purportedly compensates for the reduction of DHT by upregulating other androgenic pathways. Now, there are some people that might say, well, I did my blood work, and I also did my blood work on finasteride, and then I also did my blood work on finasteride, about a year later, and on my second time of doing my blood work of finasteride, my DHT was low, but all of a sudden, on the third time of me doing my blood work while on finasteride, my DHT is higher. And I think we have to remember that your DHT will fall, your serum DHT will fall within a range. And there are other idiosyncrasies, specifically how well your liver can metabolize the finasteride and just other genetic components. But this doesn't necessarily imply that you're going into reflex hyperandrogenicity mode where your body is just like, shit, we have to, we have to go crazy and produce even more DHT. Now when it comes to androgen receptor blocking in respects to reflex hyperandrogenicity, androgen receptors proteins that are activated by androgens like DHT or testosterone initiate cellular responses upon activation. Now, the density of these receptors in a cell isn't dedicated solely by the available androgen concentrations. Even though the body can adjust receptor numbers in response to different stimuli, merely introducing an antiandrogen doesn't necessarily spike the number of androgen receptors. DHT, notably more potent than testosterone in binding affinity for androgen receptors, is central to discussion on conditions such as androgenetic alopecia. Still, if inhibiting DHT binding boosted receptor density, we'd anticipate parallel discussions when other androgens like testosterone are inhibited. So in this case, we can imagine a hypothetical, let's say, trans person who blocked DHT, testosterone, and androgens. Would it be the case that they would also undergo reflex hyperandrogenicity? And I guess somebody could make the argument that the estrogenic hormones that they'd be taking would sort of make up for a theoretical reflex hyperandrogenicity event, but I think we're kind of just throwing too many things into the scenario at this point to try to legitimize reflex hyperandrogenicity. While the belief that blocking DHT's binding increases androgen receptor density is not widely accepted for testosterone or other androgens, it's well established that DHT does play a pivotal role in hair follicle miniaturization, a characteristic of androgenetic alopecia. Ideally, inhibiting DHT from binding to its receptor could halt or even reverse this hair loss by introducing a substance with an affinity to testosterone or even lesser than of that of testosterone. The receptor gets occupied, preventing DHT from triggering the genetic mechanism responsible for hair loss. But I'm a bit confused here myself because we seem to be jumping back and forth between if you block the receptor, there'll be more receptors coming about, which boosts the reflux hyperandrogenicity. Or if you inhibit 5-alpha reductase enzymes, then that'll cause hyperreflux androgenicity because the body's trying to create more 5-alpha reductase. So I guess what I'm trying to think here is 
What would drive the body to produce more receptors? Is it the absence of receptor binding or excessive binding of those receptors? Because if we say that those receptors are excessively being bound to by topical antiandrogens such as RU58841, and it is the binding of those topical antiandrogens that is causing for there to be an increase in the amount of androgen receptors that exist, then why wouldn't this happen with just testosterone? Why? There's just too much noise around this hyperreflex androgenicity. It's not even present in the literature. It's not even recognized when it comes to androgenetic alopecia. So I think people have to stop being so concerned about it. The assumption that DHT inhibition would amplify androgen receptor density, hastening hair loss, lacks robust scientific backing. Were DHT inhibition to markedly increase androgen receptor density, it would negate the advantages of lower DHT. And this is an outcome that's not reported by most DHT blocker users and the studies themselves. So now that that confusing part got out of the way and really the last section on reflex hyperandrogenicity was just me thinking out loud and me trying to make sense of whatever literature is available and just Ignoring the noise around it from online communities, I'm just going to say my thoughts here. So for the intricate challenge posed by androgenetic alopecia, this multifaceted strategy is essential. I believe that a synergistic approach that melds various treatments can not only stop but reverse androgenetic alopecia caused hair loss. Topical antiandrogens such as RU58841 shield hair follicles from DHT, thus preventing the genetic triggers of hair thinning. Simultaneously, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors like finasteride or dutasteride curtail the overall production of DHT, the key androgen in androgenetic alopecia. Hair growth further championed by minoxidil and trentinoin to upregulate sulfur transferase enzymatic activity on the scalp in which minoxidil can take advantage of may offer enhanced efficacy. Completing this stack with a product like Latisse using bromatoprost or latanoprost, this has been shown to extend the hair's growth phase and contribute to hair being more dense. And we see this when people use Latisse on their eyelashes. So as these treatments converge, they forge a robust defense with 5-alpha reductase inhibitors limiting the primary androgen, DHT, from being in the scalp and in the serum. Topical antiandrogens buffer against any remaining DHT by blocking androgen receptors in the scalp, while minoxidil's hair growth promoting properties are further amplified by tretinoin. Meanwhile, prostaglandin analogs bolster overall hair density by elonging the anagen phase, similar to minoxidil. And these topical prostaglandins can either be latanoprost or bimatoprost. In this sort of blend of treatments, in this sort of androgenetic alopecia stack. Each treatment reinforces the other, filling in potential gaps and theoretically amplifying strengths. And in my view, I think I already did a video on this before. It, it was in my, I think it's called uh, the hyper monoxidil responder stack. I'll put it in the description below. But in my view, this integrated stack holds great promise in battling androgenetic alopecia. Well, that's pretty much it for this video. I know it's pretty, pretty long. It might be my longest video, I think. But yeah, I wanted to make this video because in the future, when I just say things in passing, I can just reference the various videos that I've already made with the research in the description of that particular video. But hopefully this does offer some sort of insights into topical antiandrogens as a potential treatment. Now, again, the only FDA approved topical antiandrogen to treat some sort of DHT dependent condition would be clascoterone under the brand name Winlivi. And DHT, for those of you who don't know, causes the sebaceous glands to become hyperactive, thus producing more sebum, and sebum clogs the pores over time, creating acne. But Cosmo Pharmacy is currently in phase three for clascoterone as a treatment for androgenetic alopecia. So that's the only FDA approved topical antiandrogen in respects to receptor blocking. But then again, people do use RU58841, and now KX826 or pyrolidamide is coming out as well, and we do have some new novel treatments such as GT229, and in this particular case, it's a protac that's being used to destroy the androgen receptor overall. So the coming years, it will be kind of interesting to see how 
the landscape changes in regards to the treatment of androgenetic alopecia. So I don't want to let this video go on longer than it already has. But if you did get to the end of this video, if you did, because it is a long video, put in the comment section below golden star, because that is what you are, a golden star. Uh, but yeah, long ass video. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you on the next one. Check the description for the Discord for the YouTube channel, and that's pretty much it. Peace out.